Hello, and welcome to episode four of A Writer's History of Science Fiction, where I interview real-life authors about their personal take on their chosen genre. I'm Alex Howe, and with me today is Daniel Benson. I stumbled upon Dan's novel Junction on Forms for Speculative Evolution, which is of interest to me for my own writing. I've reviewed Junction on my blog, as well as First Knife, the graphic novel that he co-wrote. After that first review, he reached out to me to discuss our mutual interest in writing, and he has since been able to give me a sneak peek at the sequel to Junction, Interchange, which releases the day after this interview airs. So we thought this would be a good time to do an interview for the podcast. Hello, Dan. Thank you for coming on the show. Hi, Alex. Thank you for having me. So let's get right into it. First, tell the listeners what Junction and Interchange are all about. Uh, okay. Um, Junction is uh, my, my debut novel, actually. Uh, it's a science fiction story about um, a wormhole that it turns out has been in New Guinea all this time. And uh, it leads to a planet where there are many other wormholes that have been there for millions of years. And over time, the alien biota from these wormholes have spilled over onto the planet Junction and uh, created this patchwork of different alien biomes. Uh, And our our heroes get trapped, get lost there, and uh, they have to bushwhack their way through one of these biomes after another. And Interchange? Ah, well, right, Interchange. Interchange is the sequel. So uh, it's, uh, I can't, if you haven't read, uh, if our listeners haven't read uh, Junction, then I don't want to give anything away. But after the events of Junction, our heroes go back and uh, they, uh, what can I say without giving anything away? They uh, find an an additional wrinkle to, uh, to this planet and uh, the forces that made it. Yeah, I think that's all. (laughs) (laughs) So I read Interchange and my impression was it's Michael Crichton's The Lost World meets 2001 A Space Odyssey. Okay, yeah, that's nice. I might might use that. (laughs) Uh, I was definitely thinking Michael Crichton uh, when I wrote both of these books. Uh, and The Lost World is the next one, isn't it? So that makes mm-hmm. a lot of sense. And uh, I told you before, I can definitely see your growth as a writer in Interchange. Thank you. Uh, I'm so, so Junction was the first one, and uh, I only somewhat knew what I was doing. I knew enough to get published at all. Uh, but once that happened, then it was up to me to improve my craft. Uh, and I worked on it. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that other people agree with you that the second one is better. Where did you get the idea for these books? I think the junction first came to me when I was on vacation in the U.S. So I live in Bulgaria, um, but I'm from the U.S. And uh, one summer we were back there, me and my wife, and we were visiting her brother in California. And... Um, the beaches in California have a lot of uh, South African ice plant growing on them. Um, And so the ice plant is from South Africa, it's an invasive species. Um, It also looks very strange. Um, It's this sort of succulent cactus-y ground cover thing. Um, And I thought about how strange it looked on the beaches. Um, And I remember at at a, some kind of observation platform. You could look out over the ocean. And I looked back at the beach and I imagined seeing some kind of alien creature like a giant caterpillar coming out of that and what that would look like. Uh, And that got me thinking about this uh, boundary between uh, an alien biome and and a a terrestrial biome and what that would look like. when I was in college, uh, my one of my biology classes took us to uh, the uh, a saltwater marsh, 
um, where there are salt grasses and reeds that are adapted to a certain amount of salinity. Um, but every now and then a wave will wash up some junk, some seaweed from the ocean. And that's very salty and it kills everything. Um, but over time, there are various plants that are adapted to live in, in slightly higher salinity and they make the soil a little bit less saline, which allows other plants to grow. And you see these sort of rings uh, with dead stuff in the middle and, and new stuff growing up around it. And I thought that's what a, an alien uh, biochemistry if it was introduced to earth, it would initially kill everything. But if you gave these two biomes a couple of million years to uh, co-evolve with each other, you'd start seeing uh, this sort of uh, succession of, of plants and animals terraforming or xenoforming in the other direction. So right, that's, how, that's how I started thinking about this planet. That's interesting. I, I didn't realize to what degree this was inspired by earth biology. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's also, there's a couple of, uh, so, the, so the, the saltwater marsh, uh, you can see it in, in one of the initial chapters. Um, another thing is I have my characters sometimes look up and, and look at the sides of hills. Um, and the, the, the hills around my parents' house in Missoula, Montana, have a similar thing going on where various introduced species, I think that one is uh, Dalmatian toad flax, which has yellow flowers. And it spreads, uh, it spreads in patches from where it's been, uh, where it's been planted. And, uh, it, and you can see the yellow against the, the grayish uh, tan of the native grass. And then you can also see the dark green of the ponderosa pine trees that are sort of that are seeding themselves down the hill as their as their pine cones roll down the hill, and so you can see these patterns uh, of the different kinds of plants competing with each other. The parallel with the marshlands is that meant to be the glasslands? No, the thing that the that the marshes directly inspired was the uh, at the beginning we see that uh, the humans who've been living on Junction for thousands of years have been terraforming it. Um, and they, they create these settling pools that they then uh, plant crops on. And they're, they're a bit like the terraces uh, that, that people plant rice on in Southeast Asia. Uh, and, and we see every now and then an alien organism will wander into one of these rice paddies and, and die and leave all of its biological garbage. And you get this ring of dead stuff. That's the marsh. Okay. And both of these books are works of speculative evolution, or at least speculative biology. Yeah. And speculative evolution, as I understand it, is applying what we know about biology to imagine how life might have evolved differently, uh, either on other planets or on an alternate Earth. A popular one is, what if the dinosaurs, well, the non-avian dinosaurs didn't go extinct? Right. <laughs> If you're my age, you might be familiar with speculative evolution through the Animal Planet mockumentary, The Future is Wild, and also Alien Planet, which was on the Discovery Channel. If you're a little bit older, you might know it through Dougal Dixon's The New Dinosaurs and After Man. If you're a little bit younger, you might know it from the science fiction TV show Primeval. Does that sound about right? Yeah, yeah, I think you got all of them. Um, Expedition by Wayne Douglas Barlow, I think. Which which Alien oh, Planet was based on. Oh, right. I forgot about that. And then there was just a recent one on Netflix that was called Alien Worlds. Otherwise, I think that's, that's pretty much it. There's some other lesser known uh, things, but Dougal Dixon and Douglas Barlow and uh, trying to think if there are any other great names in this field. Not that I know of. Uh, are those how you got into it? Yeah, Dougal Dixon, uh, my, so my dad taught uh, evolutionary biology in the University of Chicago when I was young. Um, and someone gave him after man as a gag. I was, I must have been less than 10. I must have been like maybe six. And it scared me. It, the, the illustrations really scared me. Um, but then I rediscovered it when I was maybe 10 or 11. And I was, and I was hooked. Um, 
over time, I started to justify it by saying, well, this is a way of teaching people about evolution uh, mm -hmm. because you can, you can use these sort of simplified imaginary scenarios to uh, show the basic ideas of evolution without all of the, uh, the complicating circumstances that, that make it harder to see. Uh, and I, I still think that there's probably, there's something to that. Uh, I, I really am a fan of fiction that teaches. And Dougal Dixon definitely produced some weird stuff. <laughs> yes. and, and it gets even weirder in Man After Man. Yeah, that was pretty strange. Uh, I think that was, I, that was probably, everyone told me ought to do it. I don't know. I don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, that's my, that's my theory. I thought that After Man was really great. And The New Dinosaurs wasn't as great. Man After Man was very strange. And his alien planet was never never appeared as a book we only get these tantalizing glimpses of it from various places did uh, he have an alien planet yeah he did he had actually i think he had two um in one of them uh the the basic the the equivalent of a tetrapod was a sort of starfish and so everything was based on a five-pointed star that was twisted or stretched in various ways uh, and the other one was a sort of Martian type planet that didn't have an ozone layer. And so uh, anything on land had to have this glass shell around it. And, his, and the muscles were, were pull muscles like, uh, like a fishing rod or a marionette string that allowed them to move around. And there are some, there are some pictures. I have one that I, that I bought. I actually met Dougal Dixon very tangentially. At, uh, at LundCon, the London Science Fiction, the, the World Science Fiction Convention in London. And he sold me uh, a sort of, it looks like a brochure for a bounty on an alien creature that I guess is a, an agricultural pest. So we're trying to, to kill these things. Uh, and it, I really wish the book was around, you know? I, I didn't realize he did any of that stuff. Mm-hmm. He was also in The Future is Wild. He was, he was involved in that in some mm -hmm. way. Yeah, you, you can definitely see the link between Afterman and The Future is Wild, although The Future is Wild turns down the weird parts. I think so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, some of, the, some of those, uh, those animals ended up being very beautiful. Mm -hmm. So uh, your dad taught evolutionary biology. Yeah. Do you have... Uh, other scientific background beyond that? Uh, well, when I was in college, I minored in biology. Um, I didn't end up getting a bachelor's degree because I missed uh, organic chemistry. Uh, it's actually a funny story because I, I went to uh, someone in the, in the biology department with my plan to study abroad in Japan. Um, and she was like, well, that's going to be difficult, but you can do it. If you follow this strict schedule of classes, you'll be able to take the prerequisites for everything and then finish with a, with a bachelor's in biology by the end. And I wrote it down and I lost it. Uh, so I ended up graduating with a, with a bachelor's in Asian studies, um, but, but without anything in particular in biology. So I'm really just, uh, just an amateur. A, a bachelor's in Asian studies a minor in yep. biology, and now you teach English as a foreign language in Bulgaria? That's right. That, that sounds like an interesting path, right? How, how did you wind up there? How did I wind up in Bulgaria? Uh, my wife is Bulgarian. We met in college, um, and uh, after we graduated, we stayed in the U.S. for a year um, for what's called optional personal training, um, if you're a non-citizen, you can stay in the U.S. on a student visa for an extra year um, and look for a sponsor to sponsor your, your visa. Um, my wife actually got sponsored. Uh, a big company paid a lot of money to sponsor her, but you, it's a lottery, and she lost the lottery. Uh, so she got this scary phone call that said, you have 10 days to leave the country. And uh, that was it. Uh, so then I followed her. <laughs> Here we are. Did you actually teach in Japan or did you just study there? I did. Uh, actually, that's where I learned 
that I liked being an English teacher. Um, I was, my plan before that was to teach biology to like high school, high school level. Um, but so I knew I liked teaching, but um, when I was in Japan, I, I taught English. Uh, I didn't get paid, um, mm -hmm. but I, I had regular classes at the nearby university. Um, and I really, really liked it. Uh, and then when I graduated, I, um, I put that on my resume and it looked like, so I taught English classes at the prefectural university of Hikone. Um, so everyone was like, oh, that's really cool. And I got, and I got an interview. And uh, once I was at the interview and I said, well, I didn't pay me, the, the guy, the interviewer was still impressed enough to give me a summer job teaching uh, in Boston. Um, and then that was my, uh, I taught then professionally in, in Boston before I came here. And then I continued to teach here. And what inspired you to write science fiction generally? Um, I always have liked science fiction uh, back some before I could read, you know, when my dad read to me. And I always, probably also from before I could read, I tried to write. I had, I tried to seriously write something with the intent to write something novel length uh, after I graduated. I'd written a few short stories and actually I submitted them to magazines when I was in college, but I didn't get published. Um, then after I got published, I really uh, seriously wrote a book. It's called The Kingdoms of Evil, and it is available on Amazon, uh, although it doesn't have an ending. Uh, but after that, but that took me five years to write. My next novel took me two years, and now I'm, I've gotten it down to maybe a year or less. Uh, so now I have a, a nice production routine that can just get these books out. So going back to Junction and Interchange, one of the impressions I got reading them is that you've made a point of writing characters who have very deep flaws and are trying to overcome those flaws. Yeah, I think that's fair. That's a, that's a true statement. I thought that was an interesting choice. I think it's done pretty well. Um, there's a fine line between characters who are flawed and you're rooting for them and characters who kind of come off as unlikable. Yeah, it's, it's, a very, it's very difficult. And uh, it, I depend a lot on beta readers and my, my agent and, and if it gets published to the editor to tell me where the character is unlikable. Mm -hmm. uh, because of course I like them. Uh, yeah. But I don't like reading about characters who are flawless. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't like reading about characters who are basically flawless, but have one meaningless thing tacked onto them. I, I want people who are really struggling and, and are, are, are really working through their chaotic lives like we are. What I usually do is I, I write the book and the, and the character is very unlikable and nobody likes it. And then I, I have to sort of ratchet back the <laughs> the problems the personality <laughs> problems until we get to someone who is just likable enough to keep you reading until they start to solve their problems you know and then they grow as a person and that's very interesting along those same lines this is my uh english literature class <laughs> yeah theory i feel like there's a theme of people struggling to understand each other in the book uh, mm. it's especially in, in interchange mm -hmm. because you have Anne who just struggles to understand other people. Yeah. You, you have Moon who thinks everyone else doesn't understand him. Farhad who always has another lie underneath his previous one. And uh, Dice K, the main character who's been in show business so long that he just can't be genuine anymore. He does understand people, but he can't reciprocate very well. Right. Well, he's, he's terrified. Daisuke is terrified that he will show someone his true self and they will turn away in disgust. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's his, that's his struggle from the first book. And then in, in the second book, 
he's he's learned a little bit how to do that but he still doesn't like it so it's very hard for him um, and uh i think that was that was the characters that i ended up uh that we ended up with is is daisuke in, in junction it was daisuke the the showbiz guy and his love interest the biologist who is completely unlike him in every way who's uh who cares about what is true and factual and isn't good at other people and as a way of making herself feel better about that she tells herself that uh who cares what other people think anyway and uh we we sort of grind through Daisuke's problems in the first book and in the second book it's time for Anne to grind through her problems yeah I, I didn't quite see it that way but oh, that's definitely I'm right I, I saw that we were dealing with Anne's problems but I didn't quite make the connection uh-huh that was my intention anyway I had this conversation with with my agent uh when I was asked to write the sequel I was like what should what should Daisuke do and my agent was like, Daisuke's basically done everything. He uh, got over his, his uh, psychological problems. He has the love of a good woman. And, uh, and now he, and he's, he had this adventure. What, what's, more, uh, what's more there for him to do? And I was like, okay, well, what about Anne? And my agent was like, oh, yeah, she's a mess. She can definitely, <laughs> she can definitely stand to uh, have her own spiritual growth. Yeah. Uh, uh, so I, I think Daisuke did have some development in interchange, but yeah. Anne definitely had a lot more. Right, right. Well, I I think that Anne is the main character of interchange. Uh, I can I, see that. Yeah. Um, I think I was actually, uh, there was a little bit of pushback from my editor who was like, why does Daisuke even need to be there? And I said, well, they love each other. <laughs> they should spend some time together. Uh, so then I had to find... Uh, some more stuff for Daisuke to do, but I wanted to I wanted to write about how now they're so they fell in love in the first book and now they're together. But your your relationship problems don't stop once mm -hmm. you get together. In fact, they begin at that point. Uh, so I wanted to talk about the the struggle that this this couple goes through as mm -hmm. they try to make themselves into people who deserve each other. I guess. Yeah. And you can definitely tell reading Junction that they're going to need that. Mm -hmm. So um, this is, this is something I like very much about Korean dramas. I've only recently started watching them, but what, ha what really impresses me about them is that the characters in Korean dramas aren't supposed to be role models. They're not paragons of, of virtue their screw ups and and sometimes rather unfriendly difficult people uh but then the show is about how they how they grow and i'm that really impresses me and and i want to i want to do that myself as well <laughs> both as a person i was thinking as a, as an author but also as a person that would be nice too i'm not going to give anything away but at the end of interchange you have uh what i thought was a really good sequel hook do you have another book planned? Thank you. Uh, well, so uh, they haven't asked me yet, but they didn't ask me to write book two until we were uh, a month out from the launch of book one. So I was very surprised then. Now, I don't know what's gonna happen. We'll, we'll see. I certainly have ideas for, for book three, but I don't know if any of those ideas will make it into the final draft. That's the other thing. I know you did a few sketches for Junction showing what the alien life looks like. Have you done any of that for Interchange? Um, yes, I haven't liked very many of them, but I do actually, I have a lot of sketches from while I was working on the first draft. Uh, I actually spent, um, so I, I give myself dedicated writing time every day uh, at the same time every day. And uh, then it's up to me how I spend that time. And uh, when I was working on the first draft, some days I didn't write, instead I, I sketched. And I, I tried to figure out different uh, interesting alien ways that uh, animals could move 
or that plants could grow that you that you don't see on Earth. So those those sketches are are in my sketchbook, but I didn't I haven't managed to make any color illustrations that I've been that I've been satisfied with. So let's talk about the rest of your writing. Okay. You, uh, you co-wrote First Knife, which is a graphic novel that's sort of a post-apocalyptic story. Yeah. And you also um, write uh, mm -hmm. alternate history and time travel? Yes. Um, my time travel book is currently being shopped to publishers. So I don't know if I write, <laughs> I've written time travel, but I don't know if you can read time travel yet. Um, although that's not true, you can't. Uh, I self-published book uh, my book Groom of the Tyrannosaur Queen. Uh, so that's that's time travel. That's alternate history, and I think it's a lot of fun. Uh, it was an experiment to see whether uh, self-publishing was the way to go, and for me, it looks like it's not. It hasn't sold very much, but it's time travel. Um, and then uh, my alternate history stories. Uh, the, the three big ones are in the uh, Tales from Alternate Earths anthologies. Uh, so there's Tales from Alternate Earths 1 and 2, and then 3, uh, I think they say, will come out in September. And have I missed anything? I, I do know you uh, uh, published a fair number of short stories that are general science fiction. I haven't gotten any short stories published in the, the real markets. I've put some short stories up on my website. My novella Petrolia was published by a press that went out of business, um, but you can find that novella on my website for free. It's, it's also speculative biology, speculative evolution, at least because it's Van Neumann robots that self-replicate and over time mutate and evolve like, like we do. But I have two essays that were that were published by real publishers that uh, that were about my experience with cancer, um, which I which I had while I was writing Junction. So there's there's probably some there's probably some evidence of that in the story, uh, and and then of my recovery in in interchange. Okay, moving on to maybe writing more generally first, and you've alluded to this, but how did you get your start as a published author? Well, I, I tried to go, I, and I'm still trying to go traditional. Um, so I wrote my first book. I sent it out to agents because I, I, I got some good advice from Charles Strauss, the science fiction author. Um, I sent him a message on his website and he answered it. And I said, should I get an agent? And he said, yes. So I submitted my first book to agents and some of them requested a manuscript, but they, but none of them wanted to publish it. I then wrote a second book and I sent uh, that to agents and they all rejected it. But one of them said, please send me your next book. And so I wrote that book and I sent that to, to my agent, Jenny Goloboy. Um, she now works for Donald Mass Literary Agency. And she tried to sell that one. That was Groom of the Tyrannosaur Queen. Uh, and so she couldn't, she couldn't find a, a buyer for it. And I ended up self-publishing it. And then she tried again with the fourth book. Again, no dice. The fifth book, again, no dice. The sixth book was Junction. Uh, and that's and that the one that got published. Uh, and, uh, and now she's, uh, and now she's, she's trying to, uh, to find a, a home for my neck for the, the, I don't know, I think book eight and we'll, you know, fingers crossed on that one. Have you gone the self-publishing route with any of the others? So I self-published my first book, Kingdoms of Evil, and I tried to serialize that on my website as well. And I, I did get a little bit of traction with that. Um, but I realized that the people who make serial publishing and, uh, and self-publishing pay for them are the people who write a lot, who like don't do anything else. And so like, especially, like for self-publishing, I've heard that you need to publish, publish at least a book a year and probably two 
in order to make a living at it. And that's only after you've built uh, a fan base. And at the beginning, you're writing a book a year or two books a year, and you're not making a living at it. And then, of course, you have to do all of the other stuff, like the cover design and the typesetting and the editing and the promotion and the marketing, or else you you pay other people to do it. And I can see how the, the so for example, um, Will White is a, I'm a fan of his, and he seems to make it work. Uh, he, he employs basically a, a small publishing house for himself. Um, but I didn't have that much startup capital and I didn't have the time or the skills to do it. Like I can't, I'm not a good publicist, certainly. And I'm a mediocre artist at best. And I'm also a terrible editor. Uh, so I don't want to do any of that stuff. I want to write. Uh, so I, so that's why I'm still plugging along with traditional publishing. Uh, and it's, it, it's it's a geometric progression. I'm 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 rather higher than I was at the beginning, but that that initial tail. Uh, so I first started writing seriously right after college. That was 2007, and here we are in 2021, and I have one book published and another on the way. So that's and that seems about normal. A lot of other authors I've talked to and read about have said something similar that it takes, like. 10 to 20 years to, yeah. uh, to heat I, up. I started writing seriously in 2007. Uh-huh. Yay. <laughs> We're writing buddies, writing twins. Yeah. That, that was my senior year of high school and still working on it. Although I yeah. have also published a few short stories on my website. So what is your writing process? Oh, uh, you, you say you take time to write every day. Uh, yeah. How do you go about that? Well, my process is, is rather complicated and involved at this point, because um, I guess my, my meta process is to write every day. Um, when I first started writing, I said at least an hour a day. And now it's almost always two hours, uh, if not more. But I, but I started by giving it time. And I said, okay, this much time a day. And then I started reading books about how to write and I took notes on them. And one of the pieces of advice I got, actually this was from a person at a science fiction convention. He told me, uh, write a journal where you reflect on what you wrote um, with very shortly. Like today I tried to write uh, the, the fight scene and it didn't go very well. Next time I'll try something else. That, you know, just two or three lines. Um, and those two things, setting the time every day and reflecting on it, that grew into a whole thing, a whole ritual. Um, so because I reflected on these things, I found what worked and what didn't. Um, so I found, for example, that keeping count of the words that I write is terrible. It is really not only demotivating, but unhealthy for me. Um, and I found the times of day when, our, when I write best. And I found that uh, if I have, I, I have a, an honest to goodness altar, which, I, which is an Ikea tray with a candle and a potted plant on it that I, that I light uh, with a little ritual before I start writing. And then after I stop writing, I pat myself on the back and say, good job. And I eat a piece of chocolate to reinforce the behavior. <laughs> and then I, and then I, I write in my, in my writing journal. Um, and I expect that over time, my writing process will become even stranger as it evolves in its own direction. <laughs> um, but I, but I've, I found a way to figure out what works and then do it. I feel like I'm still in the figuring out what works stage and uh, the pandemic threw a wrench into that. The pandemic is interesting. For, for me, my, my meta process was established at that point. And so things changed. So like the exact time of day that I write and the exact rituals around it had to change to accommodate being locked in my house um, with my kids. But, but by then, my 
process was so robust that it just ground through this stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. It doesn't, and, and now it doesn't matter if I'm at home or somewhere else. Uh, a couple, last week I wrote uh, in the car waiting for my wife to go to the dentist. And, and I, I said, well, this didn't, this wasn't as good as if I was at home, but I still wrote. I think that, I think that the, the operant conditioning of eating a piece of chocolate each time has very, <laughs> has really helped uh, because I just, I just write. For me, uh, the issue is that the one thing I found that definitely works is that I do better with an externally imposed schedule. Mm -hmm. And I've been working from home for the past 15 months. So I don't yeah. really have that. I, I noticed that too, when my kids left, uh, I mean, they didn't run away. We sent them to, we sent them to uh, the village uh, in, in Bulgaria, everyone has a village. So we sent them to our village with, uh, with their grandma, with my wife's mom. Um, and I found out that I'd actually been depending on them to give me some structure, strangely enough, uh, where, cause they wanna go outside, they need to do their homework, they need to be fed. Uh, and I needed to switch off with my wife and mother-in-law to do all those things for them. Um, so during the, uh, during the lockdown, we had sort of crystallized into this intricate tapestry of interlocking wheels to do everything that needed to be done. But once they were gone, they didn't enforce me taking breaks. And so I started to spend too much time on my computer and I got, and my productivity dropped actually. So yeah, there's something to be said for the pressure of time constraints. Who or what would you consider to be your biggest influence in your writing? It changes, uh, it has changed over time. And it's, it's, partly, it's partly intentional. Uh, when, I write, when I'm writing a book, I intentionally read stuff that I think will inspire me for it. So for Junction, and for interchange, I tried to read stuff with biology in it. I remember Neil Stevenson. Uh, I read I read some of his like techno thrillers that, and I really liked the voice that he uses to describe machines and mechanical processes. Uh, and Werner Vinge, I was trying to get at least his people in an alien environment doing stuff. Michael Crichton, of course. I I read a lot of Michael Crichton uh, when I was writing when I was writing Junction and then a lot more when I was writing Interchange because that's the, that's the thing that I wanted to get. In general, my, I guess my favorite authors are Lois McMaster Bujold and Terry Pratchett in, in genre fiction. Uh, so I, I'm, I usually am reading one of their books at any given time. So uh, they're probably an influence on me all the time. And then I read nonfiction, uh, you know, nature stuff and biology stuff too. Uh, there was a really good one called The Forest for the Trees um, about a, an English biologist who got a house, who retired and bought a house in a forest and he likes the forest a lot. Uh, and um, Your Inner Fish, which is about the, the guy, one of the guys who discovered Tiktaalik, the, the fossil fishapod it's called the sort of proto tetrapod uh and he talks about the homologous structures that are in our bodies that we inherited from our fish ancestors and that actually none of that stuff appears in the in my books because my books are about aliens and they didn't evolve from fish um, but the ways that a body that is adapted to do one thing ends up being turned upside down and adapted for something else uh, was very inspirational that kind of ties in with the next question. And I think this may be more re relevant to you than the other authors I've interviewed. How do you deal with world builder syndrome? World builder syndrome, meaning you build too much. Mm -hmm. That's something that I wasn't, I wouldn't have been able to answer that question yesterday, but uh, I had, I happened to talk to a friend of mine. I gave him a sneak peek of, of interchange. And he said, at the beginning of interchange, you talk about this, a uh, situation where there's this alien planet that New Guinea villagers have built a village on. I want to read about that. 
so he went back and read Junction instead. Uh, and he, he said, it was very interesting how you introduced the topic in stages. Uh, you said, first, it's a wormhole in New Guinea. Then there's another planet on the other side of the wormhole. The other planet has people on it. It's been, the, the wormhole's been there for a long time. And the people who live in the New Guinea highlands have gone through it and built a village on the alien planet. Uh, the alien planet has more than one alien biome on it. It has a whole bunch of other wormholes that all lead to different planets. And then the plot begins. And I didn't exactly realize that I did that. In fact, in earlier drafts, I just presented all that stuff at once because uh, when I was planning the story, I said, I want to have alien life forms and terrestrial life forms living together for long enough that they can co-evolve with each other. How is that gonna happen? And so I, I had to invent the wormholes, make sure they were there for a long time, put them in a place on earth where they could be there for a long time and we wouldn't already know about. Uh, and then the politics that emerges from that. And I introduced all that stuff at once and no one liked it. Um, and I had Anne Tibbet, the science fiction writer, was kind enough to read the beginning of Junction. And she said, I wouldn't keep reading if this was the beginning of the book. Uh, you need to break up these things and introduce them one by one. Because you're the author, you know what's going on, but readers don't know what's going on. So I think now that I am aware of this, I can say that a, that a good cure for world builder syndrome is how many wrinkles can your audience take? How many levels of, of uh, cause and effect can you, can you have before the story begins? Once the story begins, then you can introduce one cause, its effect, its effect, and its effect over the course of the book. And that's not, that's not world builder syndrome. That's interesting. That's part of the plot. Uh, that, yeah. That's definitely a that question. Uh, sort of. That, that's definitely okay. an important piece of the puzzle. Uh, I uh -huh. can clarify, world builder syndrome is more along the lines of you spend all your time world building and don't actually get to the writing. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay. Well, that that I I uh, hit very hard at the beginning of my writing when I because uh, when I was in high school, I worked on uh, this project called the Speculative Dinosaur Project, where we we created a timeline in which dinosaurs uh didn't go extinct and that was all world building and i saw a lot of other people who were saying like oh one wouldn't it be cool to write a story here but i could see that we were spending all our time world building and we weren't writing a story so i think my first solution to that problem was start writing the story don't wait until the world has been built because it will never be built just start writing the story. I guess you know that you're ready to write. I mean, I feel like I want to start writing the story, but I guess I feel that way because I have characters and I know what's going to push them out into a story. Uh, I know the inciting incident in the, in the parlance. And after that, and then I start writing that. Uh, and I don't wait for the, the world to settle down some of the world building will happen because of what the characters need to go through. And uh, the other part is time. Again, I say I have writing time. This is writing time. This isn't world building time. Uh, and so I can, I can make sure that I spend my time writing. That's, that's actually very uh, valuable in the project I'm working on now, which includes a constructed language. Um, and constructed languages can eat up your life. Uh, you're like, what if I made this sound change? And three weeks later, you're like, yeah, that sure was a sound change. Uh, yeah. So I really have to keep that limited because my tendency would be to spend all my time on the constructed language. Yeah, I just don't have the patience to do a whole vocabulary. Well, there are ways that you can, there are ways that you can fudge that. And, and you know better programming than me. So you can actually, you can do a lot more of them than I can. Uh, you can tell the computer to generate words. This is for any of our uh, people who want to be uh, conlangers. There are several lists out there of common words 
So like the Swedish mm-hmm. list. Toki Pona is a, a conlang that was designed to have as small a vocabulary as possible. So you can take the Toki Pona vocabulary and, and start from there. The other way to do it is to translate stuff like music or, or poetry or news broadcasts or whatever from English into your conlang. And that will show you what you need and what, what vocabulary you're missing. So which of your books did you most enjoy writing? Mm, I like all of them. I, uh, I can say that Junction had some points in it that I didn't enjoy writing. That was where, so I was, I was developing cancer. The, the tumor was growing uh, and I didn't know it. And I was feeling sick all the time. And, uh, and it was also causing some psychological problems. And I was thinking that if I wanted to be a serious writer, I had to not have fun with writing. And I was using this program to track my word count day by day. So it made this graph. And the, the steeper the line on the graph, the more words you're writing. And if you stop writing, then the graph goes like that. And it put me into this panic, this constant panic that uh, I wasn't writing enough. Uh, and I was totally miserable. And um, my wife was like, you can tell, you can tell that you're miserable mm-hmm. writing this stuff. Uh, this is not good for you and it's not good for your writing either. So why are you doing it? So that, you know, then I had this health crisis and I went to the hospital and I came back a month later and spent the next two years recovering. And uh, during that time, I learned how to be kinder to myself. And so the readers might be interested to compare uh, Junction, where I cut out all the parts where I was really miserable when I was writing, so they're not there. But you can still compare the before and after um, Mm -hmm. of Junction before my my cancer and uh, interchange after when I was recovering. Uh, I certainly knew how to enjoy myself more uh, when I wrote Interchange. I think this is an area where we differ because I generally don't have trouble with tracking word counts. Oh, okay. I sometimes end up switching up how I do it, but uh, it usually helps me. Okay. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I sometimes look down at the bottom of the screen to see the word count of the document and to say, you know, um, you know here I am at 60... 7,000 words in my current project. 67,000 words, that's almost at the level where it's a novel. My eventual goal is to get to 100,000 words. Am I on track? But I think part of that is also the, 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 the work that I've done on myself since then uh, to not have, I guess I had this tendency to be afraid that I wasn't doing enough, that I wasn't fast mm-hmm. enough. So that was really bad for me. Uh, but for other people, you know, if, if it works for you, great. So what's next in your writing career? Well, it would be nice if the book that's being shot right now would get published, would get picked up. Um, I'm also working on a sequel to First Knife with uh, Simon Roy and Artyom Drakhanov and Jason Wordy. And uh, we're, we're just getting to the point where we can start pitching it to publishers. I'm on draft three now of an alternate history story with, uh, with a constructed language in it. It's the, it's the language of the Thracians, who were an ancient people who went extinct. What if they didn't go extinct? What sort of language would they speak? Mm-hmm. That's the most important question. Uh, so I'm on draft three of that. And, and when I finish, it will be ready for beta readers and maybe a year out from going to publishers. Uh, and I have the first draft of a, of a speculative evolution story called Fellow Tetrapod, which is about timelines in which different animals on earth evolved intelligence. And it's the first draft. So it's two years out maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, and after that, I have various ideas and maybe they'll ask me to write a sequel for Interchange. And so that's where I am. Now, since this podcast is about the history of science fiction, there are two questions that I ask everyone I interview. Okay. Uh, the first one is, what do you consider to be the first science fiction novel? Ah, 
Well, I think the official answer to that is Frankenstein. And um, I have no problem with that. I think, no, actually, yeah. Uh, I think I, I can't, I was gonna say that there's, there's a point where, where science fiction becomes sort of magical realism. Um, but I think that, that even way back in the, the 19th century, there was some science fiction where the authors were really uh, trying to be accurate in their science. And I, I think that's what makes it science fiction rather than something else. So Frankenstein, very nice. Okay. And the second question is, do you have any must reads in sci-fi that people might not have heard of? Ooh, that they might not have heard of. Yeah, right. So uh, people have probably heard of Werner Vinge. Look, Master Bujold, if you haven't heard of her, you absolutely should read the Miles Farkosigan series. Her other books are also good, but they're fantasy. Um, but uh, the, the Miles Farkosigan uh, saga or whatever is, um, is a really great example of how you can have science fiction with, a, with an eye to accuracy with also very, where the characters are very important, uh, whether or not, and, and the plot is, is character driven. So they're, they're a really great balance of those aspects of science fiction. Um, stuff, other stuff that's, that you might not have heard of, uh, Greg Egan. Greg Egan is, is the science fiction science fiction. Uh, he, has, he has books, his more recent books have, uh, have had where the laws of physics are different in, in various ways. And that causes different, what to us looks like magic, but there, but it's all connected to itself and it's all rigorously proved by the characters in the books. Uh, so that's really impressive. Um, so, we, and, and his, his books are often books about scientists trying to figure out how their universe works. Another, honestly, the best book I've read recently was Anna Karenina, uh, which is in science fiction. There's, I hesitate to uh, recommend this because I was very disappointed in the most recent book. But if you want to read the first three books of The Darkness That Comes Before, uh, it's, it's fantasy on the face of it. But it, I, you could make a good argument that it's science fiction, what if hell existed? And, the, and whatever physical uh, laws you need to justify the existence of hell. Uh, and then what do the people who live in this universe do with that, where, where hell is an objectively verifiable thing that happens to people after they die. And it's, it's very unflinching from that. Uh, it's written by a philosopher. Okay, let's, let's stop there. I think that's, that's three recommendations. That's enough. Okay. And finally, what advice do you have for aspiring writers? I think my advice for aspiring writers is to write every day, give yourself time to write every day and reflect on how you did keep a journal. If you do those two things, everything else will grow out of it. Okay, good advice. Dan, it's been fun. Yeah. Thank you again for coming on. Thank you. And Interchange. If you're listening to this, the day it airs uh, is coming out tomorrow, so check it out. This has been a Writer's History of Science Fiction. This podcast is part of the broader Reader's History of Science Fiction, which is available on all the major podcasting platforms. If you want to see more of my work, including some short fiction, you can visit my website, sciencemeetsfiction.com, and Dan's website is thekingdomsofevil.com. Link in the description. In the next episode, we'll be taking another look at the wider category of alien artifacts in science fiction, along with what you might call more deliberate and less tangible artifacts in alien first contacts. Thanks for listening.